Welcome to the Fustel Fit Podcast with your host, Nicola Fustel. Straight talking, body positive coach and personal trainer. Nicola brings you your weekly guide to finding real health and fitness and to live the life you deserve. So welcome, Pollyanna, to the show. Thank you. Thanks so, for having me on. You are very welcome. It was really nice to meet you, obviously. It was a while ago now I met you at the Wife conference which is the women in fitness empowerment and um, I noticed you because you spoke a bit about eating disorders and I thought oh you know that's interesting and at the time it was something that I was going through and considering doing the bodybuilding and a lot of the women there um, mentioned to me that it wouldn't really be good to do bodybuilding um, which obviously I didn't listen to so I've kind of done like a full it's been about a year now I think if not more so a lot's changed since then, and um, I'm just really interested to hear your story. So if you want to just start by going back and just telling us a little bit about yourself and just show your story. Oh, right. Okay. So, I mean, I, I guess I had a fairly normal childhood in that my parents got divorced, but that's not uncommon these days, and I can't blame that for having an eating disorder. Somewhere along the line, as I was growing up, my confidence dropped even though I'm not sure I realised it at the time, I was I was a fairly happy child, I think, on the outside. But I definitely had body image issues from a very early age. I I do remember distinctly telling my stepmom when I was sort of eight or nine years old that I felt fat. Now, whether that was true or not, I don't think I was overweight. Maybe I had a little bit of, of a growing, a bit of puppy fat. But there was clearly issues somewhere going on there. But it, it never really elevated into anything. And then when I went off to school, um, the next school I was at, when I was about 12, things um, started going wrong again. And I, and I would go through phases where I would um, not eat for a couple of days, but then it would blow over. And then for a couple of days, I'd be making myself sick and then it would blow over. And again, there was clearly some underlying issues going on there, but it, because it never escalated into a serious eating disorder, um, it was never really dealt with. I never really spoke to anyone about it. And so it was why, only when I got think those to... Things, why do you think those things happened at that age, though? Were you aware of eating disorders? I actually wasn't, no. I mean, certainly at the age of eight or nine, I had no idea what the term eating disorder was. Um, I did have some idea by the time I was 12. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't understand anything to do with food or calories. I didn't understand the connection between um, lack of calories, meaning that you would lose weight. All I'd read or picked up somewhere was that if you want to be skinny, you have to stop eating or you or you can make yourself sick, which is another way of just a avoiding having food in your system. So I didn't really put the two and two together at the time. I'm not even sure it was. I think most people um, with eating disorders will say this as well. It's not really about the food. I think at the time I was being bullied um, I I was feeling really out of place. I was I wasn't happy at all at that school. Um, I had a tough time. By the time I left the school, I was much happier and I had some good friends, but I did have a tough time settling in there. And I think this was perhaps my way of trying to get some control over the situation and, and trying to feel like I had some some power over myself. And, and, and I had low self-esteem anyway, and I think I just took it out of my body. Yeah, a lot of people talk about that, about having control because there tends to be some other areas in our life and if we feel like we've lost control or there's something we just can't change, it always seems to come down onto ourselves and how we feel internally and then we seem to think we can control that by food and changing our bodies. I think it gives us a distraction as well and a sense of purpose. I know that if I felt that I wasn't good enough to achieve other things, one thing I was able to do is control my food, control calories and control my body. And it felt like I was good at something. It felt like I could achieve something because I didn't feel like I was able to do anything else. My self-esteem was just too low. Yeah. And how did your family react to the way that you were eating at such a young age? Um, uh, some of the time when I was about 12, I was at boarding school. And again, it would be sort of a couple of days at a time. And it really, really didn't escalate into anything 
series at that time although I was I was unhappy for parts um but it, it didn't really take off too badly until I was it was when I was 18 years old and I was at dance school so kind of classic situation there was a lot of pressure on you to be the best to look the best and I'd gone from being quite good in in and known for being quite a good singer quite a good dancer um I was living in the Channel Islands in Jersey at the time it's a very small place and it's very easy for everybody to know you for um for being good at something and then I went off to this professional dance school in London and suddenly I was a very small fish in a big ocean and I think that really really knocked my confidence I'd gone from being one of the best to really not being one of the best at all but the thing is these some of these dance schools are so commercially led and they they know what sells they know what looks good on magazines and they know what looks good on tv and they weren't shy in telling me that okay it didn't matter so much that I wasn't the best dancer or I wasn't the best singer or whatever because I had a pretty face and I may as well just go into modeling and I look good on tv and basically they implied that's how I got into the school is because they thought I had a face for tv and in some ways that's flattering but actually it really really wasn't because it meant right well I may as well just give up on this dancing nonsense and just focus solely on my appearance if that was that's all I've got to offer then I may as well just concentrate on that from now on and then at the time also, I had some problems. I had um, a boyfriend um, who ended up going to prison, um, which I won't go into. But basically, obviously, at that time, that was devastating. And that was a really, really tough time to go through. And that was really hard. And I think everything compounded. All the pressure just took to me. And it was that Christmas just after I turned 18 um, I'd had a typical Christmas day, you know, overindulged, nothing, no binging, but just, you know, eating a lot of food. It's Christmas day, as you do. But when you're at dance school, it's it's quite hard to get back into the swing of things if you're unfit and you don't keep up your fitness over Christmas. So I thought, you know what? All I'm going to do is just um, wipe the day clean. And I, I took some laxatives, like a lot of them. And for, you know, without going to details, it worked. And I thought, right, this is a one off. But then I did it the next day and the next day. And then after that, when I realized I couldn't do it again, I started making myself sick. And then that on, went on for a while. And when I realized that I was making myself miserable, like going in this constant cycle of, of making myself, myself sick, I wasn't binging, but just every time I felt guilty, that's what I would do. Guilty about eating even, the, you know, just one little treat piece of cake or something. That's what I do. That's when I switched to restricting food. And that's when it and, and all this happened very, very quickly. All this happened within the space of a couple of months. And it was all down here from there. I very, very quickly started losing weight. I was pulled out of dance school and eventually I was hospitalized. So, I mean, you, you appear to be a very slim person anyway. So I imagine you didn't have any weight to lose, really. Did people like notice that you were losing weight? At first, I mean, you know, at, at, the one thing I was, um, the last thing the dance school ever said to us was have a nice Easter, don't eat too much chocolate. And the thing, the other thing I remember before I left there was being the, um, the congratulated for being the only one who over Christmas hadn't put on weight. So once again, oh there was no praise around being good at dancing or having um, worked on, on my fitness or, or some of my ballet skills over the holidays. It was all well done. You didn't put, you didn't get fat over Christmas. So just reinforcing that message again, that the one thing that I could be good at was not putting all on weight or losing weight and just reinforce that message and uh, it, I think it did it on a subconscious level because obviously I didn't want to be anorexic at the time but I did want to be good at something I did like that praise and it made me feel yeah. good and, and I think that it is a drug I think you'll agree it is like it's an addiction and that feeling of um, achievement when you've lost another pound even when you're dangerously underweight it is addictive it gives you that rush and it's a very dangerous mm. rush that the anorexics get yeah because you never know when the end of it is and if no, you are no, seeking but... that um opinions from other people that praise then it just makes you want to keep going even when you get past the levels of becoming unwell that's it i mean i was a fairly normal bmi i think i was about um about a bmi sort of 22 23 and because i was a dancer a lot of that was was uh, muscle as well so bang on the middle of the healthy range and I had a goal of being slimmer but still healthy so um, just just very healthy just getting back down to, down to about a BMI of 20 or something but of course once I'd reached that 
the goalpost moved and it would be like, okay, you know what? Just, just one more kilo. And then that one kilo would come off and about, oh, do you know what? I, I, look, I can see in the mirror, just one more, just one more. And then it got to the point where I'm going, okay, I know I don't need to lose any more now. I can see I don't, but that was when I was stuck and I couldn't stop anymore. Mm. And were they weighing you at this dance school then? They weren't there, no. No, they didn't have any inkling in the slightest. In fact, again, it was um, it was family members who picked up on it when I went back that Easter. Um, they did pick up on it early. I mean, I was I was losing weight rapidly. I wasn't dramatically underweight at that point, but I was losing weight, and they could see by the way I was eating that it was not normal in the slightest. So I was taken to um, an eating disorders outpatient clinic to have an appointment. But of course, you have to get a diagnosis of anorexia. You have to have you have to be at a certain low BMI. So I was told there and then you do not have an eating disorder because we can't diagnose you as having an eating disorder because you're not light enough. You have eating issues. Now I think that's a fairly ridiculous statement. That's a very very silly way of doing things. So of course, people are going to have eating disorders and be overweight, normal weight, anything. Yeah. But needless to say, that's what happened, and I still received outpatient treatment. But uh, I just didn't respond to it, wasn't responsive in the slightest. And I, I was pulled out of dance school and I was told I could go back if um, if I managed to get my weight up. But were you aware of it at the time? Like were all your peers doing the similar kind of thing? Were you all eating the same? Well, at dance school, I wouldn't say anyone had... Um, well, there maybe you know, I think there was a couple of people perhaps who actually had genuine eating disorders. There was a lot of disordered eating, if you know what I mean. There was a lot of body consciousness and guilt after eating junk food and awareness of the fact that you have to stay slim as a dancer. Although, of course, when you're dancing sort of five, six hours a day, it's pretty hard to get overweight. You know, you're burning off so much that it shouldn't really be a worry and you have to fuel your body to be a good dancer. But everyone was aware of this. There was a lot of talk of body image of, of oh, you know, you're in you're in leotards and tight clothes all day. There's nowhere to hide. So I think that, that makes you pretty body conscious as well. And yeah, there was a lot of discussion and talk about diets the whole time and comparing bodies and that sort of thing. And but that was reinforced by the teachers as well. So talk to me about when you got, um, you said you were an outpatient. Yeah. And then things escalated more and you became an inpatient. Yeah. Well, the first time I, um, I had outpatient treatment that summer um, and I did manage to get my weight up. Um, uh, but then I went off to a different dance school, tried to start again, fresh start. But obviously the demons hadn't quite been dealt, been dealt with. And I very, very quickly lost weight again. And within, I think by, I think I, I didn't last a term there. I think I was pulled out um, just before the Christmas holidays. And I think within a week, I was in an inpatient unit at a very low weight. So how did you feel going through all this? Did you still see yourself as fat in the mirror? Do you know what? This is the funny thing because a lot of um, people with eating disorders have this distorted body image where they they see something that's um, grossly larger than they are in real life and they yeah. perceive themselves to be really, really fat. Now, I had the odd day like that. I, I'm a woman. I still have the odd fat day because fat days aren't about being fat. Fat days are about how you feel. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew I was skinny. I, I knew what I looked like. But I liked that. It gave me this control. I knew it was wrong, but there was a part of me that really got a thrill of being so scrawny and, and so emaciated. It made me feel powerful. It made me feel special and it made me feel different. And I think that was something that I'd, I'd been lacking. Those feelings, those feelings of being special and being somebody who was important without all of that. I think without the anorexia, I felt like a nobody. And this gave me a persona. And that's yeah. why it was so hard to let go of. So whilst you were there, what type of therapy did you have? Oh, we did everything under the sun there. It was a it was a private hospital. So as well as having very strict meal plans where you're not allowed to leave the table until your plate is clean. Um, we did CBT. Um, I think we were allowed to do two 15 minute walks a day around the grounds with a nurse. Um, we we there was some yoga once a week. 
um what else did we we did everything we had talking therapies group chats um it was a unit so i was there with quite a few other people it must have been about about 10 other um people all girls all um all had eating disorders but all in the same unit together sort of going through it together and as there's, there's pros and cons of that i mean the, the pros are that you can share experiences and try and help and support each other the negative side is you get this competitive thing where yeah. when you're going back to that one of wanting to be the best be the skinniest be the illest and, and that can come out as well in those units, yeah. which isn't so good. But So coming out of therapy, how did your eating change? I did my best. I, I was determined I was going to do this and I was going to beat this. And I, I, you come out with a very strict meal plan to follow. Um, and, I, and I did my best and I, and I tried. But the thing is, the, um, and I don't know how, whether you experience this as well, but with eating disorders and anorexia, it's like having a little, a little devil on your shoulder who speaks into your ear. And when you're trying to stick to your meal plan, and you're and you know what you've got to eat and you've got to weigh out this food or measure out you know the the teaspoon of butter or whatever it is you've, you've got to use there's something in your ear going don't eat that you don't need that you don't need that bit just just skip that little bit you don't yeah. need it and this goes on and it's so powerful that you can't resist it and all it takes is is just missing one teaspoon of butter and then half a piece of bread and then just a few grams shaven off here and there but it gets more and more and it escalates and before I knew it, I was right back. And this was, I think I came out of hospital in March and I was back in a different hospital by the following July. Wow. Again. So I quickly went downhill um, and repeated the process. <laughs> And then the next time I decided to, I decided dancing and just wasn't clearly, it was, it was the wrong career for me. It was too pressured. So I decided to go into beauty therapy. So I went back to college and I moved in this time with my mum, who just lived just down the road from me now, uh, because she lived just down the road from where, where the college course was that I wanted to do. And also she'd be there to, you know, help support me and that kind of thing. And I did really, really well there. I, I, for about, um a year it was i think it was a three-year course or was it two year i can't remember anyway i stayed there for a good couple of years um and then started going back downhill again and once again once it started going downhill it escalated very very quickly and that resulted in my third and final hospital admission when i was very very ill both mentally and physically now, I was actually put under a section in that one because, to cut a long story short, I wouldn't cooperate. I didn't want to be there. I didn't think there was a point in me being there. But they had to force me for my own well-being. And in hindsight, obviously, they were totally right. Yeah. But I did fight it at the time. And that was my uh, my last admission. Um, I came out from there about, must have been about four months afterwards. Um, tried to sort of stick to the meal plan, but... Once again, this is for now. We are on about six years later now, and this has become quite a way of life for me. Um, and once habits are ingrained, and this applies to people who are wanting to lose weight, get fitter, as well, any kind of habit changes they've been doing a while, it's really, really hard when these habits are so ingrained. Yeah. When it coupled with all the psychological issues behind it as well, I just, without even trying, I just almost from the day I came out of hospital, I started slipping again. And so I that that's on the plan was to go back to college in September. And by that summer, I'd, I hadn't lost a load of weight. I was probably about maybe three, three or four, two, three, four kilos underweight. So not not hugely, but I was slipping and it was going in the same direction. It always had been. However, I remember distinctly it was a really sunny day. We were sitting outside the pub with some friends just, uh, just down the road from my mum's house. And one of my friends, who was about the same age as me, announced she was getting married. So, of course, this is really lovely news. And her sister, um, also similar age to me, announced that she's having a baby. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. And we're sitting here in the sun and everyone's moving on with their life. And they've got careers. They're building families. And I thought, do you know what? I want some of that. That's, and it was the first time in my life I felt really, really sad. And, like, that my eating disorder no longer was giving me this thrill and yeah. giving me the satisfaction it once had. And I realized, actually, this isn't how I want to live anymore. And I, and I want to get rid of this and, and I want to do it. And I knew it was going to be hard, but something changed for me that day. And I do remember it distinctly. And not, I think it probably in the same week, um, 
I um, I was approached by someone, a guy in the pub, in that same pub. I was there quite a lot that summer because I was uh, I had a bit of time off going back um, back to college. Um, and he asked me out for a drink. And so we went out for a drink and we got on really, really well. And he said to me, um, look, he, he noticed that I was underweight and I was skinny. And he questioned me about it. And I was open with him, I was honest. And he goes, look, well okay, whatever, that's your business, but I really like you and everything, but I don't put up with that nonsense. I don't understand it, and I've got no place for that. And if you want to be with me, then you've got to get this nonsense out of your life. And that's how we saw it, absolute just nonsense. Just stop being stupid, just start eating. That's all you've got to do. And and that was the reinforcement, because I, re- I really liked this guy as well, and I thought that was the reinforcement. I got, right, yeah, I can do that shit. It is a load of nonsense. And if I really, really, really put my mind to this... I can do it. It's not going to be easy, but something had changed in my head. And I went from reluctantly knowing I should get better to actually wanting to get better. And I and people ask me, what is it that made you change? And I wish I could give them an answer and say, oh, it was just this. But it was almost like I'd, it was like I'd grown out of it. It yeah. was like I woke up one day going, enough. I don't want this anymore. And now I say, this, this man is my husband now and we've got two lovely oh, children. So... <laughs> I was wondering yeah. if you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. So all went. So he doesn't take really any well. nonsense then. <laughs> no, he he doesn't at all. And he still. I mean, the thing is with eating disorders, especially if you've had them quite a long while, the voices don't always go away. Just, I wouldn't say I I don't have an eating disorder now. I would say I'm in control of it, and I still get these voices in my head a lot. I still get um. I still get the thoughts in my head and I have to battle every single day to make myself eat, but it's a battle that I'm winning. And if ever, and he understands me so well, if ever I'm having a bad day, I feel really fat today, I feel this, oh, I don't want to eat that because I've already had too much of this. He'll say, he'll actually do it in a joking way. He'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're looking really fat today because he knows it's, all he's trying to say to me is don't be so stupid, shut up. Yeah. And he makes light of it, and but he understands so much as well. He understands also that if I'm having a fat day, like I said before, fat days, every woman has fat days. A fat day, people say to me, how on earth can you have a fat day? Because I've always been fairly petite. I mean, I'm only five foot two and um, and I'm, I'm fairly slim. I've got very small bone structures. So people say, how on earth can you have a fat day? I said, well, that's the point. A fat day is nothing about, nothing to do with being fat. A fat day is about have, feeling a bit naff in yourself it's about feeling a bit down a bit overworked a bit stressed and for me I, I always know and I have to stop myself and whenever I'm thinking oh do you know what I just think I should I think I just lose just half a kilo just a pound here and there I think I'm, I'm not feeling good about it. I think my thighs look fat today I have to stop myself and go hang on what's this really about because this is not about your thighs. What's going on here? What's happened this week to make you feel like this? And it's always something. There's always something that's happened or something that's going on that's making me feel bad. But my first reaction is to take it out of my body. But luckily, as I said, these days, it's a battle I'm winning. It's a battle um, I'm determined I will always win. At least you can recognise that now. But what I was really wondering is what stage did you then get into the fitness industry and do you think that some of your eating disorder or your body image pushed you into the industry so then it was another way of controlling your body no i would say i know for some people that is definitely the way and i know there's a lot of um talk about how some people use the fitness street fitness industry and especially um competing like you've done as a way of disguising disordered eating because of course once you're if you're competing for a stage competition it's it's the norm and you need yeah. to restrict your diet and you need to do um abnormal dietary practices um for me, it was it was completely opposite. Obviously, I came from a dancing background, so I have quite a lot of um, nutritional and uh, physiology and exercise knowledge already. But for me, it came from the other way of learning that actually there is so much nonsense out of there of fad diets and a distorted body image and people feeling unhappy about themselves. And yet exercise and food, when used correctly, they can make you feel and look absolutely amazing and I wanted to try and get that message out I wanted to try and stop people from um 
from from thinking like punishing themselves by going on these restrictive regimes when all they have to do is actually care for their body and the looks will take care of themselves because you're you're eating to fuel and you're eating to nourish your body not restricting yourself to punish yourself and and I determined to that's the approach I always want to take I, I I always try and tell people you know don't not eat the ginormous piece of chocolate fudge cake with loads of ice cream and marshmallows because <laughs> you you know as a silly example because you it because it's fattening and you want to lose weight eat something really nutritious maybe some greek yogurt with fruit and you know whatever it is because it's got loads of nutrients and calcium and vitamins and because it's good for you and then suddenly you're approaching healthy eating from a positive point of view and eating well means that you're gaining something not losing something and you're not missing out because of all this great stuff you're getting from your healthy lifestyle yeah so do you feel like now that you're with your husband, all of those areas of your life that were missing before that you seeked in your eating disorder are now fulfilled? Yeah, I absolutely 100% feel fulfilled now. I feel um, I've got two gorgeous children. So I've, um, I've got that unconditional love there. I've got an amazing husband who supports me through everything. And now through my job, through the Fit Mum Formula, I get to help other women with their body image issues. Now, just to clarify, I'm not a counsellor. I'm not trained in any area of psychology at all. However, I think it's, I don't think I've met a woman who wants to lose weight, who doesn't have some kind of psychological, emotional issues with the food. Because if you think about it, losing weight from a practical point of view is not difficult. It's you need to eat less calories. You need to stop eating the junk food and, or eat less of it. And most people know what they've got to do. If I was to ask any woman, how do you tell me? How do you lose weight? They could tell me how to do it. However, getting them to do it and making them do it is a completely different ball game and that's where we have to go in a little bit deeper and say okay why can't you do this why aren't you why aren't you sticking to this what's stopping you what makes you think this and almost every time there's there's some underlying beliefs some thoughts around food the beliefs about their abilities of what they can achieve and about their own body and there's always things there that are stopping them from doing what is actually quite a simple thing to do but at the same time, anybody can lose weight if you get into that mindset. But then it's, you know, 95% of people don't keep it off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a certain amount of, there's there's physical stuff as well. I mean, there's, um, if you're not on a, a diet that is, is sustainable, then there's, if somebody comes to me saying, God, I've done this diet and I lost loads of weight and then I put it on again. And there's a, or I say, what's worked for you the past? They said, well, I did this, this and this and it really worked because I lost 15 pounds. And I said, so, uh, and so what stopped you doing it? You, you stopped doing it. They said, yeah, but then, but then I came off it. I'm like, well, to me, that doesn't mean it worked because if you couldn't stick to it forever, that's not in my eyes. That's not working. You know, like you can lose weight. Um, I was speaking to somebody just earlier today who said they've lost 18 pounds on diet pills. Now, I don't know what it is that she's taking. But um, and she said, oh, she just thought it would be a, be a kickstart. I said, yeah, but what's, what's that teaching you? As soon as you stop taking those, you haven't learned anything about how to eat properly and eat in a way that's sustainable for life. You haven't learned the skills to be able to eat well anywhere. I, I want my mums to be able to go to any restaurant, to be able to go on holiday, to go um, go for meals um at friends' houses, dinner parties, and they understand their bodies, they've got a good relationship with food, so that being healthy isn't a yo-yo thing, it's, it's a constant, they can they can enjoy food um, in a normal way, but that doesn't mean they have to be losing or gaining weight the whole time, they, they can be a happy medium where they, where they just eat normally. Yeah, I mean, you, everybody has to find their balance, don't they, and it has to fit in with their lifestyle. And everyone's individual, so it depends on you know how what what works for them and their families totally. and work and everything. Totally. Yeah, I, I'm really reluctant to give out meal plans. I have got a service where I can write custom meal plans, but I really don't like doing it because honestly, how am I, on earth am I supposed to know what exact meal plan? And but people want it really detailed. They say, just tell me the calories to eat. But I don't know your body. I don't know your life. I don't know how your body's going to react to certain foods. So I can make a very good guess based on my knowledge of nutrition and, and bodies and your lifestyle and things. But honestly, it's not going to be something you can stick to for life. I prefer to teach people, give them a kind of a basic template. Okay, okay here's, here's a starting point. 
Now we've got to see how you feel. Now we've got to see how your body reacts. Are you losing or gaining, if, if that's what they need, weight um, at an appropriate rate, if that's your goal? Are you hungry all the time? Because that's not good. Are you craving foods all the time? Because if you're craving things, especially sweet foods, something's off there, something's off with your brain chemistry, yeah. and that makes you crave sweet things. And, and sweet, starchy, fatty things and salty things like chips and stuff as well. And if, you're, if you've got no energy, you know, any of these things are warning signs that your body doesn't like what you're doing. And even if you're losing weight, that we need to change that because you're going to fall off the wagon somewhere. Either because your body is, if you're, if you're restricting yourself too much, your body itself is going to react. And it's going to lower your metabolism too much and it's going hormones are going to go out of whack. Or, or you're feeling so naff on it and you're hating the way you're feeling that you're just going to give up. So if you're not feeling great on it, we've got to change it. And I'm constantly getting people to just tweak and adapt things and learn from what they're doing as well and they say oh you know I was doing really well until I did this and I just couldn't resist and then I ha ended up eating all of this and all of that I said okay hang on stop why did that happen not just you shouldn't have done it why did it happen what had you eaten earlier in the day what's been going on earlier in the week often with mums it's because we're underslept i'll say oh, how did you sleep the night before oh the yeah the two-year-old had a really bad cold they were cough coughing up all night i was exhausted didn't see like, ah right that's what it is hunger's up cravings are up you were underslept now we know the problem we can try and find solutions to this thing but again that comes down to that no one diet will work for everybody forever because life isn't the same always forever so that you know we have to adapt and we have to learn the skills to be able to adapt to that but it's also it's hard as a trainer isn't it and a health professional where people come to you and they just think that the ultimate two things that are going to change their life are food and exercise yeah and each person has so many more things deeper layers than that and even their health in terms of sleep and stress levels you know and their digestive issues those kind of things are so much more than just food and exercise yeah, they are. But there's a good phrase that I've heard from some, uh, I can't remember where I heard it, but it's sell them what they want, give them what they need. Yeah. So obviously my branding with the Fit Mum Follower, it's all about mums getting in shape, losing weight. And yes, that is something that they want to do. But the things that, but if I try to sell them a uh, better digestion and a better mood, all of that stuff is great, but it's really not the biggest focus. In their head, they just don't like look like what they look like. So I, I give them the idea, you know, that they, they come to me wanting to lose weight, but once they're with me, they realize actually all this other great stuff is happening too i suddenly discovered that you know i i can fit in exercise and i can do these i can make healthy meals and that boosts their self-esteem and they've got more energy and as you say the digestion's better and all this kind of and then those results in themselves reinforce that that healthy behaviors because um because they're feeling so good that they don't want to stop what they're doing because it, it just makes them feel so much better and that, that's much better than just having um a weight loss goal because i think that's possibly part of the problem with some of these diet clubs and swimming clubs out there where people lose the weight and then they put it straight back on again and then they lose the weight going but they go back there and and then the problem is is these these diets they're on they do make them lose weight but they're feeling not great in other ways you know they they're hungry and they're not enjoying it and they've got to count every single gram of everything they're doing and they've got to compare charts and it's just it's not an enjoyable way to live and to um, go to a group where you have to stand on the scales in front of loads of people looking that can't be good for you yeah <laughs> i mean I, I don't know i think some people mind that more than others but i think just the whole process of doing it i'm there's one particular diet club at the moment i won't mention them but i'm i'm beginning to think that i'm i'm the people who pick up the stragglers from there because they keep coming to me saying oh, i've been on that and it just didn't work and yeah. they're telling me i can eat all this and it doesn't work and i don't understand and i was so hungry and all of this and i'm going oh not another one well and that's it's the thing because... it's good that they've come to you because i i've found people before have come to me or, or no, ha haven't come to me, but they've been telling me that they, they did that thing and they lost the weight. And even though they put it back on, they just know that that worked. So therefore, they think they need to do it again because somehow they failed. Not that the diet failed. They think they failed and therefore they must go back to the diet, which is why obviously these companies keep making money because people keep failing and then coming back. Well, that's why um, when I chat to people initially, one of the first things I say to people is, what have you done in the past that worked? 
and then they'll tell me and I say okay so so why did you stop doing it then and they'll give me all these reasons like they were hungry it was inconvenient it was awkward it was just they got bored whatever and I said well then I don't class that as working like I was saying before, I said, that's that to me, uh, you lost weight, but I, I don't really see that as a very good solution, to be honest, because you come out the other side of it, put all the weight on, haven't learned anything about your body, how your body feels and um, how to eat properly and make meals in any situation because you're just tied to this one system. And I think possibly that's I think that is how they work. They, they don't teach you actual nutrition um, by the books, you know, yeah. how we would learn it as nutrition professionals, yeah. which is a universal system. Um, things like calories, macros, carbohydrates, they, they teach them their system. Yeah. So you either so if you don't know any better about nutrition, and most people don't, they're not fitness fitness and nutrition professionals. They're they're not you know it's not their hobby like um but they're not really interested in it like we are. So they just want to know what they need to know to lose weight. So they go along to these things and they learn the system, but as soon as they come off the system, they don't know how to eat because all they've learned is this one way. So as soon as they're not doing that way, they put the weight back on. Yeah. So, and it, and it's almost cult like in that respect. Um, and I've, I've heard people say who, who come to me, they said they've gone to these classes and some of the leaders, it, it is, they use the word cult. They say, they, they say no, it's, it's our way or the highway and, and this is the only way and you follow it or you're not welcome here. It's well, a shame really because it's supposed to be inclusive. <laughs> we're, we're, we're supposed to be making people feel better and making their lives better. Well, so it's I, the money making business, really isn't it? But can I just, just um, zoom you back a little bit to where you said about having your children? And yeah. you've mentioned about still having that voice in your head, like the ED voice, um, eating disorder. Did you feel any different when you were pregnant and your body shape was changing? Um, I loved my bump, actually. I really, really loved it. I mean, I didn't gain loads of extra weight. So I didn't get, I didn't gain pregnancy weight as such. I just gained an enormous bump. And no, I really, really loved my bump. Um, and I wasn't bothered about that in the slightest. Um, I tried to be a lot more relaxed, knowing that I, I could be more relaxed and I needed to fuel my body uh, well to, to help grow this baby. Um, I was really hoping, I'll be honest, I was really hoping that nine months of not thinking so much about food or trying not to think in an eating disorder way about food and just going, oh, I'll just eat when I'm hungry, I stop when I'm full and whatever, that that would be the cure, in quotes, for me because I would just relearn that and that skill to be able to eat when I'm hungry, stop when I'm full, have yeah. a little bit of what I feel like, the occasional treat, yeah. just it's like everybody else body, does. It's funny how like, your body naturally does that when you're pregnant, isn't it? And you have like warning signs of certain food. Yeah, yeah, and I was I was really hoping that that would basically turn off these these voices in my head. Unfortunately, it didn't. Um, but but I didn't. That's not to say I restricted then, and it's not to say I restrict now. However, I still got those voices in my head, and I don't talk about that so because it's because it's so often that I, I would bore people if I went on and on and on about my eating disorder all the time. Um, but it is. I'll be honest. It's it's almost every day I've got this voice in my head questioning what I'm eating but I can argue with it I know logically what I've got to eat I'm I'm quite rigid with what I do it doesn't look like it from the outside but I know in my head I have an exceptional knowledge of calories I have a very good knowledge of nutrition both from my experiences of you know being when I was ill I would study it and also because I'm qualified now as well I've got nutritional qualifications but I've got very good understanding of food so what to other people might look like I've just thrown food on a plate I know what's there and it's and I feel I have still got that element of control in my head that I don't know whether I'll ever be able to let go of it maybe I will maybe it won't but the thing is right now I'm so happy I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life um I've got more freedom around food than I've ever had I'm physically the healthiest I've ever been in my life I think I've got a brilliant family I've got um great kids and so if I have to be a little bit mindful of my food then it's a very small price to pay considering it, and things could have From ended very very, yeah. very very worse you know I could have I could have died either yeah. through you know through organ failure or whatever so um, are you left to... now are there any um like health issues that you have now just from how all the damage that you've done to your body back then 
I have um, osteopenic bones, although it's been a while since I had a bone scan. So um, apparently I can increase my bone density. Osteopenia is sort of like mild osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. um, I did at one point have um, something called a pericardial effusion, which is fluid around my heart. Now that was discovered in my last hospital admission um, because I was having ECG I think every day I was having ECG scans to keep an eye on my heart, and blood tests every day. Um, so, and that, but that's gone away now, and they don't know if that was related to the eating disorder or not. But it's it's not a serious condition. Um, there were some things that were temporary at the time. Things like things showing up in my blood, my blood tests, like liver and kidneys are starting to fail. Heartbeat was slow, but obviously as I got physically healthier, all of that you know righted itself pretty quickly. I am pre-diabetic now. Now, we don't know why that is. My paternal grandfather was diabetic. He had type 2 diabetes. Um, so perhaps there's a gene that I've inherited there as well. It's possible that I've, I've got that because where, um, this might be a little bit technical for some listeners, but that basically your pancreas below your stomach pumps out insulin in response to your food intake, especially carbohydrate, and also your body weight and body fat levels. So where I was going from very low food intake and very underweight, swinging back in hospital to putting the weight on quickly and eating a lot more food, then losing it all again, it might have just been that my pancreas said, look, we don't know whether we're coming or going here. We're not going to play ball anymore. So now it's not full on type 2 diabetes. It's just pre-diabetic. So that means I have to be a little bit careful of um, things like sugar intake. But again, that's the, you know, I think most people need to be a bit mindful of their sugar intake. So it's, it's not a big deal at all. So no, nothing, nothing serious. But yeah, there are a few, few little things. But again, things could have turned out so much worse that I'm just so grateful. Like I've managed to pull myself through it because I've got such a, a wonderful life now, and I couldn't be more grateful for all the things I've got in my life. So and also everything that you ever do and ever experience makes you who you are today. So all yeah, of that, I feel 100%. really bad for my family. I, I put my parents through absolute hell and all my brothers and sisters, you know, it was such a worry for everybody and that I feel bad about. But it wasn't your fault. You it wasn't, well. it wasn't illness. It, it, was, it wasn't my fault, but nevertheless, they did, they did suffer through it. But everything I've done and everything I've experienced has brought me to who I am today and yeah. what I'm doing today. And I'm very happy with that. And so for that reason, I don't regret any of it. It's, it's taught me so much about myself and about life. I think it's made me quite a wise person because I've seen and done quite a lot. And I've, I've known what it's like to be at the absolute depths of depression. I mean, when we say, I, I think if there's a hell I've been there, I was so depressed in my last hospital admission. I was, absolutely believed there was no way out and that's why I tried to leave hospital because I just I was in the bottom of this pit and I could not get out and having been there not a lot bothers me in life these days you know everything is small details nothing everything that other people think that you know the little worries day-to-day -day struggles and stuff like do you know what most people in this country have got life really really good like things like when when with the the last, um, you know, leaving Brexit and everything. I was like, oh, this, that, we can't have this when we go on a holiday, we can't travel. I'm like, oh, boo-hoo. Do you know how lucky you are in this country to have yeah. all of these things you've got and all, all the amazing things you've got in your life? There are some people out there who have nothing. They've got no home. They've got no family. They're on the streets. You know, they're in third world countries. And I think my experiences have made me so grateful for the life that I've got. But um, I think, yeah, I, I think I'm almost, if it sounds strange, but I think I'm pleased that I've gone through all of that because it's made me who I am today. Yeah, definitely, 100%. But also as a parent now, how, how do you parent your kids in terms of eating well without them then thinking about their body image? Are you very well, that, mindful of what you say to them? That is something I'm very, very conscious of because although I'm aware that um, there's possible genetic links to eating disorders, I know that they're... Kind of, I'm not sure how um, conclusive those studies are, but I know there's possible genetic links. But certainly, like all genes, a gene will never be triggered without the right environment, and that's yeah. the bit that I can control. Now, I try to be as normal around food with them, or around myself as well, as as possible. I try and be, I try and keep them healthy, like any 
normal parent would do you know no if they don't eat that one last bit of they only have to have one more mouth of broccoli and then all right yes then we can have some pudding but no they need to have a mouth of this and i try and make it as normal as possible i don't um i don't stop them eating anything um I, they can have you know they can have treats they can have sweets if it's if they're at a party um i let them free you know if they eat way too much cake they learn you know, they come back to me saying, "Mummy, I feel really sick. And I said, well, all right. Um, um, I said, what, what have you eaten that's made you feel sick? And they said, oh, I ate like five cakes. I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> that was a bit silly, wasn't it? You'll learn next time. Maybe yeah. five was a bit much. <laughs> and I think they, they need to learn um, learn their, their own lessons. One conscious decision I did make is I breastfed them for a long time. I breastfed Aurora, my firstborn, till she was two and a half. And I breastfed Bella till she was three. And that was a conscious decision, not only because of the nutrients and because it's good for them, but also because I know that um, breastfed children um, are very, very in touch with their appetite because they have to feed themselves. Oh, really? And I've I never wanted heard them. of that. Yeah, I wanted them to have that. I because that's one thing you lose when you've got an eating disorder, and even today, yeah, you know, intuitive I'm, eating. Yeah, that's it. I I'm a lot more um, in touch with my hunger these days than I used to be, and and that gets better all the time. That's something that improves. But um, uh, certainly, when you've got an eating disorder, it's not about how hungry you are, what food you fancy. It's your head taking over, saying you should or shouldn't do this. And what I want for them is to be able to say, I'm hungry, okay, you can have some food. Not hungry, okay, you don't have some food. And I don't ever push them. You know, sometimes um, uh, they'll, they'll sit there and, and they'll be trying to battle through a meal because then they can have their pudding. And I say, look, if you're not hungry, you don't have to finish it. If you're really, really not hungry, you can have it a bit later. And they know that. They know when they're full. In fact, my kids, I'm really, really proud of them. But they're so in touch with their hunger. Unlike some children, don't have don't seem to have an off button. If you could put them in front of an entire tub of ice cream, they won't finish it. They'll go and then they'll go, I'm full now. Mm -hmm. And they know exactly, like bite to the mouthful, they know where they've had enough. And but they're I'm both sure that happens. Full. I think it's the parents that do that to the kids. Because if you think about babies, like you're saying with the breastfeeding, they know when they're hungry, they know when they're full. And yeah. the same with children, it's only their environment that changes that. So if the parents restricted them from the ice cream, then when they finally get it, they're, they're not going to have that control. They're going to want to eat it all because they don't know when the next going to get it. So it's actually good just to allow your kids to have things. And then they naturally, like you said, with the children and the five cakes, you know, maybe they have a bit much once and then they learn from it. That's it. And also, um, I, I want them to, you know, being hungry means you need to eat. Now, um, that might mean I have to be strategic about what they're going to eat. So if it's only sort of half an hour, 45 minutes out for an actual meal that I'm making for them and they're absolutely starving. OK, I'll say, all right, get some fruit out the fridge. You know where it is. Or, um, OK, do you want some carrot sticks or something lighter like that? But if they're hungry, I'm not going to make them go hungry for too long. Obviously, a little bit. If it's 15 minutes out and they're whinging like today, they were. But the ice cream, um, the queue for the ice cream was really, really long. And we had to get back and I had a bit of a whinge for half an hour cycling back home. But I said, look, it's not going to kill you to be hungry for half an hour. We're going to get some food as soon as we're home. And we've got some ice cream in the freezer. You can have some after your lunch. So a little bit of hunger. I think they need to learn also that, um, that it's not going to hurt them if they're hungry. I think that's maybe where some adults have a fear of hunger when they get older. Yeah. They 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 don't allow them to get themselves to get hungry. They have to have a full belly and it sort of makes them feel contented. And it does. It goes back to, you know, when you're a baby having warm breast milk, you know, it does make you feel contented having food in your belly. But so at the same that, time, a lot of people who've had disordered eating, because myself when I was coming out of recovery, I was panicking if I got hungry because if I got hungry I, it meant that I might end up binging so I had to always make sure I was just full that's funny you know that's where when I was ill I to I would almost uh, and until I was down at my you know very very worst state when I was eating hardly anything some of my meals would almost look normal because I had so many vegetables on my plate and salad so cal cal calorifically, it was very low calories, but actually I had quite a full plate and I would eat loads and loads of vegetables and things like vegetable soup and anything filling. Because just like you, I had that fear that if I'm hungry, if I get too hungry, I might binge. Now, I never did. Never, ever have I actually gone on a binge. But it, the fear, nevertheless, was still there. 
Um, so that's why I would always do it. But then you can use that in a good way as well today. You know, with my weight loss clients, I say, look, if you really, really, you know, if, if you if you do over it, if you get too hungry and they do end up eating things that perhaps aren't so helpful for their goals when they're too hungry, I say, look, are you eating enough in your meals? Not just vegetables, but other things as well. Like if you're restricting yourself too much, then you're going to be hungry. But if obviously you can't be having too many calories when you're trying to lose weight. So make sure you're eating enough vegetables. So you can use that in a positive way as well. Um, but you're going back to parenting, you know, they're, they're, they're great. I, I, but they stop when they're full, you know, they're, if they're saying to me, if I say, if they're absolutely fine and contented and I say, right, bedtime, they go, oh, but I'm hungry. You know, I'm not that silly. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know the difference. Are you really hungry or are you procrastinating? If they're genuinely hungry and you know, as a mum, you know, when they're lying, you know, when they're sentry, if they're genuinely hungry, they can have something to eat. It'll be something slightly healthier. I don't want them bouncing off the walls at bedtime. But they, I'm not going to make them go to bed hungry if they are genuinely hungry. But at the same time, if I can tell, I say, look, are you actually really hungry or are you just not wanting to go to bed? And you can tell by the reaction whether they're lying or not. So um, where can people hear more of you and what's next for you? Well, I'm about to have a new website go live. I don't know when this podcast will be aired, but that'll be sometime in September. In the meantime, the old website is still live. It's www.thefitmumformula.com. Um, I'm on Facebook as The Fit Mum Formula and Twitter is just Fit Mum Formula without the the. I've also got a free group on Facebook, which any um, anyone's welcome to join. It's called Weight Loss and Fitness for Mums. And actually, there's a pin post. If they find the Fit Mum Formula page, the pin post on there actually takes you to the group anyway. And everyone's welcome in there. It's a really friendly place. Obviously, it is a, it is a community primarily. Um, I do help mums to lose weight because that is you know that's what most people do need but I, I don't do it just it's not a case of just okay we've all got to eat less we've all got to go on this diet and that diet we have to look at the whys and the hows as well and okay why are you comfy eating and everything because without all of that none of none no dietary protocol is going to work if you look at the reasons to why somebody can't stick to a diet mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's it that's all um i've got the body back program um all the details again of that are on the website and that, that's an online membership portal so that's how people access my services so it's um it's an all-inclusive one where it's, it's a password protected website where uh mums get all the, the resources all the workouts and all the help learning not just meal plans but learning how to put a meal together and how to learn how they're feeling engage their reaction um to create their own meal plan essentially and create their own way of living so they can relearn how to eat healthily and and live healthily forever great and you do your exercises are stuff to do at home aren't they with the kids yeah it's all home and um, they're all um body weight exercises no equipment and um nothing needed my personal favorite workout gear is my pajama bottoms and a sports bra <laughs> you probably find me doing that in my living room at 6 a.m surrounded by toys because you know what that's that's my life the reason this was um, started up in the, as a business structure in the way that it was done is because I was a mum at the time and I couldn't get to the gym. I, I could say I, I didn't have childcare. I chose not to have childcare. I chose not to put my kids into full-time nursery from the world go. I wanted to do something I could do from home. And some gyms have creches, some don't. But even the ones that do, you know, mums don't always want to put the kids in the creche. It's not as feasible. This, it, it works. People say, you know, when's the best time to exercise? Whenever it suits you, whenever you can do it. So, um, yeah, we look at individual schedules and go, okay, well, where in the week can we slot this in? Sometimes the evening, sometimes the morning. We don't need to go anywhere. It's all at home. And it's really, really easy. It has to be compatible for a mum's lifestyle because, as you know yourself, Nicola, as a, as a mum, you know, as soon as you've got kids in the picture, life changes somewhat and we are quite unique from non-parents. <laughs> yes, it's definitely a battle. <laughs> That's for sure. But, a um, good battle. Yeah, I'd like to... Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And thank you um, for Well, me. congratulations for everything that you've done and been through, really, and the work that you're doing now. And I likewise, well. I think it's been amazing watching your journey as well and just seeing, um, you know, the revelations of people sometimes have to go through the bad things, the bad yeah. times to come out the other side and see the light. Do you, would you agree? I'm definitely a, um, you know, live it and breathe it kind of person. I have to have my own experience to learn from it. 
So I've certainly done that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave Nicola a review on iTunes. You can also check out the show notes and get other free content on her website, fustalfit.co.uk. If you'd like to contact Nicola, email nicola at fustalfit.co.uk.